Ministers, ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this ministerial level, ministerial council meeting side event on the impact of tax and transfer systems on gender equality. I am Fabrizia La Pecorella. I am the Director General of Finance at the Ministry of Economy and Finance in Italy and I am the chair of the OECD Committee on Fiscal Affairs. During today's event, we will explore how governments can ensure that tax and transfer systems are designed to support improved gender equality. Our discussion today will begin with remarks from the OECD Secretary General, Matthias Koeman, followed by our chair for this event, Maria Cecilia Guerra, Italian Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Economy and Finance. It is a great pleasure to invite the OECD Secretary General, Matthias Koeman, to open today's event. Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Fabrizia, um, ministers, ambassadors, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's event on the impacts of tax and transfer systems on gender equality. Uh, improving gender outcomes is a major policy priority for the OECD. Uh, the OECD is mainstreaming uh, analysis of gender across almost all our policy areas. Uh, our OECD Gender Initiative examines barriers to gender equality in education, employment, and entrepreneurship. And we look at how policymakers can take better account of gender implications in policy design and planning. Uh, through our social institutions and gender index, we measure discrimination against women in social institutions across 180 countries. Indeed, promoting gender equality, as we all know, contributes to economic growth and it improves economic and social cohesiveness and resilience. So the potential gains of good policy in this area are substantial. Uh, in our assessment, closing the gender gap in labor market participation and in working hours across the OECD uh, could boost GDP by more than 10% by 2060. And the fair and efficient design of tax and transfer systems is a central part of helping to reduce gender inequalities. Well-designed tax and transfer systems can help incentivize women's participation in the economy, including in the labor force, and they can influence consumption patterns and the distribution of income and wealth. However, badly designed tax and transfer systems can also have the opposite effect and further increase gender inequalities. In more than two thirds of OECD countries, existing tax policy appears to discourage second earners who are predominantly women from increasing the hours they work or in some cases from working at all. In the nine OECD countries, which still have family-based taxation, the net average personal tax rate of second earners is estimated to be 7% higher than the right applied to a single worker at the same level of income. The high marginal tax rights can turn part-time work into a trap. In some OECD countries, including in Belgium, Luxembourg, and Italy, more than 40% of the additional income that an employee receives when moving from part-time to full-time work would be taxed away. But the part-time work trap can have concrete consequences for women's careers, incomes, and their standard of living, not only when they're active in the labor market, but also once they retire. On average, women receive around a quarter less pension income than men, than men 
uh, across European OECD countries, which puts older women inappropriately at greater risk of poverty than older men. Uh, the OECD is seeking to help policymakers improve the fairness of their tax and transfer systems with new analysis and policy recommendations. The countries should consider moving away from family-based approaches to taxation by introducing individual-based provisions which mitigate the negative effects of taxation on second earner work incentives. We need to deepen our understanding of gender biases in taxation, whether explicit in the law or implicit. The implicit bias remains an issue even in tax and transfer systems that aim to be gender neutral in the law. In order to better assess and adapt our tax and transfer systems, we need more and better, better quality gender disaggregated data on the incidence of taxes and transfers. And the OECD is working on this, including through our toolkit for mainstreaming and implementing gender equality. For too long, uh, this issue has been overlooked. It is encouraging to see that it is attracting more and more attention. And thank you to Italy for highlighting its importance at this year's Ministerial Council meeting. I very much look forward to a rich uh, discussion and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words to help set the scene at the outset. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General. It is now my pleasure to introduce Maria Cecilia Guerra, the chair of this event, and the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Economy and Finance in Italy. I, like, I would like to add that uh, Cecilia is a distinguished academic in Italy. She's a professor of public finance, and she's been devoted a lot of her research work into this issue. So it is a great pleasure to have her today here. I'm pleased to invite Cecilia Guerra to provide some introductory remarks. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to open this workshop on this very topical issue, especially in the light uh, of the asymmetrical gender impact uh, of the downturn triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic, for which some economists coined the word she session. The pandemic crisis affected the woman, women's uh, well-being along several dimensions, exacerbating pre-existing gender inequalities, particularly in the domains of paid and unpaid labor. Indeed, women represent a larger share of employment in some of the hardest hit sectors of the economy, while also being more likely to work in the informal economy with part-time arrangements and the low pay paying and precarious jobs. In addition, women shoulder a much larger burden of unpaid domestic and family care work at home, and evidence indicates that most of the additional workload associated to COVID-19 fell on women. With reference to the specific topic of the impact of tax and transfer systems on gender equality, Several aspects of tax policy design extensively explored in the public finance literature should be considered, even when tax treatments are not differentiated on a gender base. I would like to recall some of them. First, the choice of family over individual income taxation may influence marginal tax rates, discouraging the labor supply of the second earner, mostly women. Likewise, women as second earners may face higher effective marginal tax rates that reflect the impact of individual income taxation and benefit system, especially in countries like Italy, providing allowances for dependent spouse. The lower female labor force participation translates into gender pension gaps in the longer run. We then have to take into account that since women are more likely than men to belong to low income brackets, they benefit relatively more than men from a higher degree of progressivity of the tax system. At the same time, 
women are less likely to take advantage of tax allowances as their incomes more often are below the basic exemption limit. Given this constraint, the use of refundable tax credits might be particularly useful to ensure that women can actually take advantage of, this, of those uh, allowances. More recently, the option of differentiating tax rates by gender has gained attention with regard to both individual income taxation, the so-called gender tax, gender-based taxation, and the employer's social security contribution cuts for women. This option raises a number of problems. As for individual income taxation, some economists support gender-based taxation, GBT, from the standpoint of optimal taxation theory, arguing that lower marginal income tax rates for women might contribute to closing the gender gap in labor market participation, while fostering a redistribution in care and domestic work on account of the more elastic labor supply of women. Nevertheless, the GBT proposal fails to take proper account of the very low elasticity of a men's unpaid labor supply. The effectiveness of tax incentives to weaken the strong gender norms that produce a lopsided distribution of care and housework duties seems highly questionable. Furthermore, the GBT proposal conflicts with the principle of universality intrinsically attached to personal income taxation viewed as a certificate of citizenship. With regard to employers' social security contribution cuts for women, there are two main drawbacks, even though evidence has shown that they generate growth in female, female employment. First, they are usually targeted at the marginal seg segment of labor market, allowing job matches, thanks to cut on labor costs, that would not be profitable at market conditions. Such low productivity and low wage jobs, namely bad jobs, are often accepted by women in exchange for more flexibility, shorter hours, and working closer to home, especially in areas with structural problems in terms of lack of adequate infrastructure and formal care services, as well as with stronger stereotypes on the role of women as caregivers. Second, since the tax incidence is mostly on firms, the worsening of gender-based employment and segregation is not accompanied by a positive effect on net wages and then on the gender pay gap. Finally, we should question to what extent the tax system can be used as a tool to reduce gender inequality when assessed against alternative policy tools such as monetary transfer, for which the means testing versus universalism issue has to be considered, and public services. On the one hand, money transfers, especially in their non-means non tested versions, are equalizing, and therefore benefit more those at the bottom of the income distribution, and among them, women. On the other hand, the provision of public services above all care services can be a powerful tool for reducing inequalities and increasing women's labor force participation. Last but not least, I'd like to stress that the impact of the tax and transfer system on gender equality strictly depends on its interaction with the socio-economic context. That is to say, for example, with differences in the level and in the nature of income between men and women, as well as in expectations regarding their social, their social roles. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing your views on these issues and other aspects regarding gender inequalities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Undersecretary Guerra, for sharing with us your reflections on the key aspects that we need to, take in, to be taken into account for the policy design uh, when addressing gender inequalities. Before moving to our panel discussions, we will uh, have a short presentation to set the scene. And uh, uh, this presentation will reflect the work that in recent years, uh, the OECD has been uh, carrying out on the impact of our tax and transfer systems on gender uh, equality. 
to share the main insights from this research, I would like to call upon Ms. Grace Perez Navarro. Grace is the Deputy Director of the Center for Tax Policy and Administration, as well as the Honorary Chair of the OECD Women Network. And Grace, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, ministers, ambassadors, colleagues, and friends of gender equality. Uh, I want to add my special thanks to Italy as well, because in fact, um, my interest in this topic has its roots in Italy. Several years ago, I was invited by an organization of Italian businesswomen, the Fondazione Belisario, to present on the issue of tax and gender. And as I started preparing for the meeting, I realized we have only scratched the surface here at OECD on this issue. Um, we have focused on the issue, very important issue of second earners, but we really had not done much else. And so I realized we needed to do more in terms of increasing uh, the data that we had about this issue and also analyzing uh, the situation so that we could ensure that at a minimum, tax and transfer systems would not hinder gender equality, but instead would foster it. Now, our recent report on the taxation of part-time work in OECD countries shows that not only are women in all OECD countries more likely to participate in part-time work than men, but when they do so, they earn lower hourly wages than men in most OECD countries at an average of 11% or less. That's quite substantial. The part-time work trap described by Matthias uh, just now discourages increased labor market uh, participation of women. And this is why we need to further analyze women's workforce incentives, including on how tax can play a role in this area. Now this year, we also issued the first cross-country analysis of national approaches to tax policy and gender outcomes, where we examine the extent to which countries consider gender equality in tax policy and administration design. And the tax policy and equity report also looks at the issue, again mentioned by Matthias, about um, implicit and explicit biases and how countries are looking at those issues and whether they are doing anything about it, as well as looking at the availability of gender disaggregated data. It's critical for us to be able to do anything in this area. Now, most countries, of course, consider that their tax system should treat men and women the same way, but they also recognize that bias can pose risks. Now, we have uh, seen in our work that um, the the direct bias, the uh, explicit bias is becoming very rare, but it still does exist. For example, in Morocco, married men are automatically entitled to a deduction for their dependents, whereas married women have to affirmatively approve that they are the head of household. So that's one example of an existing explicit bias in a tax system. Now, implicit bias occurs everywhere because differences in economic behavioral patterns of men and women lead to differences in how the tax system affects them. These differences can include differences in income level, savings, entrepreneurship, uh, consumption, ownership of assets, and even tax evasion. Did you know that women tend to be more tax compliant than men? What does that say about our tax systems? Now, explicit or implicit biases may be part of the problem, but they may also be part of the solution. In Israel, for example, women receive an additional credit just for being women. And this is because they're trying to um, address the issue that women tend to be lower uh, earning taxpayers. They also get an additional child care credit, um, additional from the one that men also receive. So we know that there are these biases in the system. Uh, we need to look and see how, when we have implicit bias, 
um, what we do uh, to address that implicit bias, whether we should address the, the bias, as Cecilia just uh, mentioned, whether the tax system should respond, and if so, how. Um, we also need to consider how responding to gender inequities will affect other tax policy objectives. In other words, tax policy makers will need to balance gender equity considerations with other tax policy priorities, such as simplification, efficiency, growth, integrity, and of course, revenue. So clearly there is a lot more work to be done. We're still just scratching the surface and we look forward to identifying other best practices and further exploring how labor tax incentives, including tax credits, uh, can be used to minimize um, the, the disadvantages that women have in entering uh, the workforce. But for now, um, we're really looking forward to hearing from the distinguished uh, panelists that we have here today. And I look forward to hearing what is happening in the countries uh, and in business as well that will be represented on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace, for setting the scene for our panel discussion. Well, I would like to thank you all to thank the Secretary General and the Under Secretary of State and Grace for your contribution. I now should like to ask you to leave the stage and I should like to ask the panelists to take their seats on the stage. We are very fortunate uh, to have a very high caliber speaker joining us today for this panel discussion uh, with representation at ministerial level from a number of OECD member countries and as well as from the business uh, uh, community. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished panel, the Honorable Randy Boissonol, Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance in Canada. And Mr. Gabriel Yorio Gonzalez, Deputy Minister of Finance and Public Credito in Mexico. And then Ms. Tara Hansjons, State Secretary to the Minister of Finance in Sweden. And Mr. Alan McLean, Chair of the Business at the OECD Tax Committee and Executive Vice Presidents for Taxation and Shell International Limited. A very warm welcome to all of you. A key part of the focus uh, for our work in uh, this area has been the importance of mainstreaming gender. And uh, in this regard, we are very happy to have a good balance of women and men participating in this event. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your participation, and I really look forward to a, a lovely and interactive uh, discussion. So without further ado, uh, I would like to get started. And well, here I would like to start, maybe a sit. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are sitting and we start this panel discussion. Well, I would like to start with the first round of question on the current state of play in terms of gender equality. And in particular, I would like to ask you to give us a snapshot of how gender equality is tracking in your country. And uh, in particular, uh, I would like to hear from you what lessons we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me begin with you, Minister. What is the current state of play for gender inequality in Canada? And also, it would be very interesting for us to hear from you how does Canada seek to measure progress in, on gender equality? No pressure. <laughs> thank you so much um, for that uh, kind introduction and thank you to all of the 
the panelists who set up this panel so well. Matthias, thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, OECD family colleagues, this is my first time at OECD headquarters. My only experience with the OECD was when you decamped and came to Montreal a few years ago, and I was able to be there when Minister Jean-Yves Duclos was presenting. So um, on this particular issue, and thank you for, for framing it so nicely, uh, we know in Canada that uh, in our country, women and girls were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And this is especially true for marginalized groups. When we talk about racialized women, uh, LGBTQ2, Indigenous, um, Black women, women living with disabilities, this was particularly the case. Et en particulier, les heures de travail des mères ont diminué. And the uh, working hours of mothers uh, came down more than those of uh, men. Uh, and so this means that there was um, uh, more unpaid work at home uh, done by, by disproportionately uh, done by women. And uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, the government decided uh, to uh, leave uh, markets uh, open. One was called the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, two of the most important programs that were provided in the Canadian context. And we also know that if we were asking people to stay home during lockdowns, that we knew that not every space at home is a safe space. And so we also made sure that we provided funding to shelters, food banks, community organizations, to ensure that Canadians, especially uh, women and gender diverse people, got the support they needed uh, if they were experiencing gender-based violence. We still have a lot of work to do on that. And my colleague who's responsible for this, Minister Ian, Women and Gender Equality is leaning on in this. And as many of you in this room know, um, Prime Minister Trudeau in 2015 uh, ensured that there would be a gender balanced cabinet. And he has kept that uh, right to this day. And I want to just give a sense to colleagues here what the government did uh, to support Canadians and women during the pandemic. We invested $511 billion in Canadians, 20% of our GDP, in people, in businesses, in governments, provincial, municipal. And it was the right thing to do morally, but it turned out to be the right thing economically. So right now, after having lost 3 million jobs in the pandemic, we're back to 3.5 million jobs. So 115% of jobs recovered, which is a faster uh, recovery than any other country that we can measure. And I, I, I was teasing somebody earlier that I was, I'm 52 this summer, I was six years old in 1976, and that's the last time we had uh, employment levels at 5.2%. So 1976, we haven't had uh, labor unemployment rates this low. And so uh, we're poised to be the top growing country in the G7 next year. And one of the greatest barriers of women in all horizons reaching their full potential was having access to affordable childcare. And this has been on the books in Canada since 1972 since I was two years old. And it took a female finance minister and deputy prime minister, Krista Freeland, to put that in the budget, to put $30 billion on the table, $8.6 billion ongoing. And my friend, Corinna Gould, a minister of families, um, social development, signed deals with all the provinces and territories. And in my own riding right now of Edmonton Center in Alberta, families are saving on average $5,000 a year. In Ontario, it's almost $9,000 a year. I go to the doors and people tell me I'm saving almost as much as my mortgage now uh, because of childcare. So that disproportionately affects women and we have the data from Quebec to show it. And the reason I wanted to share that with you is because it's a critical example of how a policy that's gonna cost us some money in the short term will likely bring us a 1.5 to 2% growth in GDP. And we also implemented a quality of life framework to our budget process, which will track uh, how we're actually affecting the lives of, of, of women and girls. And we're going to continue to make choices, policy choices that lean in on the gender-based analysis plus framework. And the plus is where we look at indigenous LGBTQ2 plus. And let me just conclude by saying that one of our core beliefs in Canada is that women's rights are human rights. You can applaud that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and let me go one step further because my colleague, uh, I served under, in the first mandate as, as Prime Minister Trudeau's uh, special advisor on LGBTQ2 issues. And I can tell you, point la ligne, comme on dit en français, that LGBTQ2 rights are human rights as well. And that intersectionality is critically important for us. 
There will be an LGBTQ action plan that will be revealed this fall. It will be funded because the commitment's in the budget. And our mission in Canada is to not rest until we have served all the peoples. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very uh, comprehensive uh, recollection of all the many interesting things you've been doing in Canada. Now let me turn to you, Deputy Minister Yorio Gonzalez. What is the state of play in Mexico? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for the invitation and for the welcoming. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. Finally in presence, so uh, this is very it's very nice to be in, in Paris uh, and to to meet with you. And let me just start that uh, well saying that Mexico wasn't an exemption in terms of impacts from 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 COVID nineteen. Uh, but before entering or getting into the details, uh, uh, the president Mexico Lopez Obrador uh, decided that he also wanted to have a a, a parity in the cabinet and also uh, identify that one of the main challenges in Mexico is uh, that we need to include women in the labor force. Uh, and that's one of the policies that we're trying to, to pursue and to, and to shape in, during this administration. So that makes us uh, design several uh, transfer programs, uh, but also to take some decisions on the on tax incentives that we will get into detail probably on the, on the following questions. At the moment, uh, let me say that we, were, we started to work on all these, uh, all these social programs, matching skills, trying to provide, to provide training. But one big decision that we took was um, that uh, to link all uh, gender pol equality policies with, with competitiveness policies in Mexico. We decided that one, one of the actions that we need to, uh, to pursue in order to grow is to bring all the labor women into the labor force. Um, and that practically, uh, we happen it happened to be uh, one of the most difficult things to do during COVID because uh, Mexico has a, a high informal uh, sector or population or labor force. Uh, also, we, we haven't developed yet a childcare system, so that creates a lot of bottlenecks in order to bring women into, into the labor force. But once we close the economy, we get into the confinement, most of women were, were heated as, as, as probably in all, the, in all countries happen. Um, and the big problem was after we op reopened the economy, women weren't able to get into the economy, as, uh, to get back to the economy and make the catch up. One of the reasons is that COVID practically amplified um, all these bottlenecks that we were suffering in our, in our economy. So ha not having a childcare system practically enabled women to get into the labor force because uh, unfortunately uh, COVID uh, impacted also elderly people. Mexico still depends on these uh, familiar structures relying on elderly people and not having them practically transfer that cost to women and they have to, they have to face all this uh, unpaid on pay labor in order to take care of, 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 of the kids or, or, or probably uh, one some of their elderly. So this is this, this one of the main uh, concerns that were, my, one of the main outcomes that we have uh, during, during COVID-19. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to reopen schools as soon as possible, to try to, to have the, to roll their, the vaccination roll out as soon as possible. Um, and also to try to transfer, uh, well, uh, to have cash transfers in order to alleviate these this impacts. But at the moment, I will say that we already um, regain our uh, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, women labor force is is, is higher than the than than the than the one that we have on before before COVID. Still, I guess one of the big the lessons learned that we have is that we need to start uh, reducing all these bottlenecks in order to, to reincorporate women into the labor force. So we have been taking some specific actions that go beyond only uh, beyond the um, uh, tax incentives or tax policies or transfers. We're trying to tackle this problem from a multi multidimensional uh, perspective. We're working with the financial sector. I will provide more detail on that. And uh, we're bringing this into the discussions within the competitive co committee that we have with the unions, with the, with the private sector in order to, 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 uh, to make the case that investing in women is going to be, uh, it, it has a multiplier effect on the, on the economy. And that's, that's, the, that's one of the, of the big steps that we are taking. Um, but practically at the moment, we, are, we have already uh, recovered all, our, all the jobs that we lose during the pandemic. Still, uh, we need to work. We are on the, one of the countries that are lagging behind compared with other peers. And that's one of the main uh, policy, policy objectives that we have at the moment.
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's so interesting. And it is so interesting to see that we, you know, there is reiterated uh, observation on the fact that it is an investment, you know, to address uh, gender inequality is an investment uh, that can give uh, incredibly, you know, high returns. Now, well, um, I would like to hear from you, uh, State Secretary Hans Jons, what you have observed in Sweden in terms of the impact on, of COVID-19 on gender equality. And this is, would be particularly interesting because Sweden has been taking uh, an approach in a sense different from uh, that of many other OECD countries. So the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for bringing COVID response uh, uh, and the policies up in this context, I think it truly belongs here. Uh, gender equality has been a big issue and we also do see big setbacks on gender equality, which uh, need to be carefully analyzed uh, throughout these coming years. Uh, I think just as you mentioned, uh, like other countries, uh, Swede, the Swedish society has been put to a large test during the whole pandemic in so many ways and uh, one area there where the Swedish policy did differ uh, from many other countries was uh, our approach to keeping schools and daycares open uh, to the extent possible. I think in Sweden we generally recognize that schools and childcare they serve actually two purposes. Um, one is the obvious, to give our children the best start in life and the best education possible. But the other one is also to make it possible for parents to work or study. And uh, I mean, congratulations to you, Randy, and to the Canadian people for recognizing this and, uh, and doing this important reform. I think uh, by keeping schools open uh, to the experience possible, this serve to protect children yep. uh, and to give them the right to education and also to uh, actually avoid additional care burden falling on parents and then due to the bias that we all have discussed here today that especially falls on women. Um, we have indeed seen an increased number of women leaving the labor market uh, to a greater extent than men in Sweden during the pandemic, but the policy to keep schools open could very well have decreased this effect. Uh, and uh, for those who have been able to work remotely also, which is uh, also a large portion of women, for example, in government agencies, keeping schools open can also have contributed to keeping the productivity during telework uh, higher. Uh, not also having a school at home uh, while trying to work. Uh, but it's not only during the pandemic that Sweden has been successful in keeping women in the workforce. And I think what you are doing in Mexico is very important here to, to bringing uh, women into the workforce. And, uh, and this is also something that we have a long history of doing. Yeah, I think for the individual, uh, the freedom of having your own income cannot be underestimated. This makes it possible for you to decide who you want to live with and uh, how you want to live your life. And it's so important. But also for society and for business, having both uh, men and women in the workforce that provides, of course, a huge gain. And... Uh, I think tax policy has in Sweden played an important role in closing the gender gaps, not only through a progressive tax system, but uh, high tax burdens on secondary earners can have a significant impact on the incentives for the labor, female labor force uh, participations, of course. But I think also, uh, it's not, frankly, not helping women uh, to take the step and join the, join the workforce if her husband, in essence, needs to pay higher tax on his income when she works. I think that's an important factor here as well. Um, and in combination with 
social norms and lack of adequate childcare is also actually lack of uh, elder care for elderly parents and in-laws, which is also an important factor. This can lead not only to employment and uh, 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 to close on, uh, employment and pay gaps, but also the pension gaps in the long run. I think this is an important factor. Uh, women often have lower income and wealth than men also in Sweden. And uh, uh, these dimensions have all been uh, part of designing the public policy, including tax issues. I think the introduction of individual income taxation happened, it happened already in 1971 in Sweden and today with very few exceptions, taxation and social security benefits in the Swedish systems are de determined on an individual basis and this is important. And I think together with, uh, uh, with uh, reforms such as uh, childcare and uh, also elderly care, this has uh, contributed to having one of the highest uh, female labor workforce participations and employment rates in the OECD. Uh, and, uh, and then also, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, discussed the, the COVID responses in, for, in terms of um, actual benefits and, and the, the packages that we have introduced. And uh, I think the, uh, it, we will speak more about gender budgeting, but this has also been important in forming these. So um, a lot of conclusions need to be drawn in the coming uh, years, mm. what happened during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And we will finish, we will complete this first round of uh, interventions with Alan, who will give us the business perspective on uh, uh, gender equality. And we would like to hear from you, Alan, uh, what you have observed from your perspective in terms of the pandemic and its impact. the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to participate today. Uh, from our perspective as business, uh, we see gender equality as a, an integral part of building inclusive business workspaces, but also building inclusive business communities. Uh, and that in turn uh, is fundamental in our view to, to issues of competitiveness, uh, to in issues of enhanced productivity, uh, as well as of course, delivering economic and uh, social well-being to individuals, both within the workforce and uh, in, the, in the broader communities. So we think there's not only a strong business case for gender equality in the workplace, uh, but we also see that as just the right thing to do. Uh, we recognize the disproportionate impact that the pandemic has had on many women, uh, and that makes this issue even more important and urgent to address today. Uh, <clears throat> the significant impact that the pandemic has had on the workplace is continuing to evolve, and I think we will all, uh, as has already been, been mentioned, continue to watch that carefully and continue to learn uh, much uh, from that. Uh, but we do see, of course, already shift to mobile work, uh, and also an increase in, in hybrid work patterns. Uh, and that uh, we understand raises particular challenges for women, including those related to childcare, uh, a sense of, of meaningful engagement at work, which is important, uh, as well as women's perspectives on, on promotion opportunities. So Business at OECD has been addressing gender equality across all policy areas, uh, including issues related to gender bias, both implicit and explicit gender biases in, in policy. Tax has always been an important part of that discussion, but perhaps now more than ever. And we welcome the leadership of the CT and work of the CTPA on this issue, including of course, the recent uh, stock take and analysis work that, uh, uh, that Grace mentioned. We also at Business at OECD have been a strong supporter of the OECD Council recommendation on gender equality and its effective implementation in practical ways. And we in OEC, Business at OECD have issued a number of reports to support the recommendation uh, focused on employment, on education, entrepreneurship, 
And of course, we'd be willing to and happy to make these available to anyone. Uh, Deloitte uh, conducted some research in 2021, and according to that research, women who work for, for what they call gender equality leaders, organizations that have force, fostered gender uh, inclusive cultures uh, that support them and promote their, their mental and physical well being, report far higher levels of engagement, of trust, uh, and of career satisfaction. And those women also indicate that they're more willing or more likely to stay longer with those employers. So advancement on those issues are important to, to business. Uh, they require not only the right policies, uh, but also uh, uh, right policies. And that includes, of course, working uh, across business, government and, and other uh, communities. But it also in, needs not just the right policies, uh, but also the culture and mindset that are required uh, to turn those policies into reality. Uh, we specifically in business at OECD recognize that in the light of the, of the green transition and the digital transition, uh, which have been accelerated, of course, by the pandemic, that, that, that we need to have particular attention to, to the needs of, of women uh, and to the pressures that they may face uh, in the face of those uh, combined uh, transitions. And to, and to find ways to, to ensure that there's broader representation in areas where they're currently underrepresented and that there are other opportunities and changes to support them through those transitions. If I may just say a couple of words uh, from the perspective of Shell, uh, which is a company that I work for. Uh, we, of course, have uh, a commitment to gender equality across all uh, areas of our workforce and uh, have managed uh, after some quite some time and quite some investment in it to uh, reach the 46 percent of our top board uh, now being women and uh, we continue to work to, to bring that up to, to parity. Uh, we recognize that, that women uh, are not only uh, an important source of employment uh, for us, they're also in many cases our investors, there are customers, there are suppliers, uh, there are regulators, so we have to understand that while many of the comments that we're, that are, that we're making today are focused on, on women in the workplace, that actually we, we understand that gender equality has to span across all of those pieces. <laughs> and in Shell specifically, of course, we've, we've um, instituted a whole number of, of um, uh, initiatives to support women. We recognize that, that women, women's career trajectories will be different from men's and, and that that is an explicit need for that to be recognized. Uh, and of course, we have in place many policies covering maternity, but also paternity. And for example, in the UK, uh, we offer all of our staff, whether they be male or female, the opportunity to take a, year, a year's paid leave. And that can be shared between mother and father uh, uh, and in, uh, in, in that uh, attempt to, uh, to bring uh, equality there. We also recognize, of course, given our, uh, the nature of the business we're in, that, that women are particularly underrepresented in, in, in the key areas of what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And uh, we've um, uh, put a lot of uh, investment working with universities, working with other bodies to try to change that. So we've gone from, whilst I think uh, STEM, women in STEM roles uh, across the uh, economy are around 11%. In Shell, we've managed to get that up to 40% through, through significant investment over many years. And uh, again, we continue to hope to get that finally to parity. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And thank you all. It was very, very interesting. Now, let's move to the core of our discussion. And uh, we, I think it is clear for this first round how you know, important are, how complex are the challenges that are faced in designing policies to address gender equality. Now, uh, I would really uh, like to hear from you, uh, how do you think we can best mainstream gender into public policy? making to ensure that the tax and transfer system supports um, in improved gender equality. And again, I will start from you, Minister Wassono, I mean, from your intervention before, it appears that Canada has a very structured approach to these issues. It would be very interesting for us to hear from you um, what Canada, um, what is the impact uh, that 
the policies that have been put in place uh, have been having on outcomes for women. Okay, uh, before we get there, I just want to thank um, uh, Yorio for reminding us how important it is to get women fully participating in the labor force. Our analysis in Canada, and I'll go through a few, a few lists here, was that full participation of women in the workforce would be a 4% permanent GDP bump. Just do the math. $100, $200 billion, depending on the, the size of the economy in the given year. And that's a, that's a remarkable amount of, of economic development that we're just leaving on the table. And um, Todd, I just, I mean, you've been trailblazers my entire life on childcare and you've got all the data to prove it, but really making sure that that, that link between public policy and, and who leaves work first to take care of families. I mean, it's just the, the data is incontrovertible, right? And so we've seen that, we saw it in Canada and we've seen it around the world. And so we've got a, uh, one of the things that the pandemic showed us is that governments can be policy nimble because lives are at stake. And it even surprised, I think, some of our federal public servants, how nimble government, and we got some things wrong and we still were able to pivot. We were still able to make adjustments on the fly. So um, I really appreciate that. Alan, I love that you've got 46%. I think it's one of the leading boards in the world. And, and colleagues, I think that as ministers and leaders and deputy ministers, we've got to step right into the issue and name it and call it out. And if you're in a room that's too white or too male or quite frankly, too straight or that looks just all the same, ask why and ask how many women are in the, are in the pipeline to be promoted? Where are the people of diversity in that ecosystem? Where in our context, where are the indigenous people? Because they want to be part of our ecosystems. And it's not good enough to say we tried and they're not available because they're available. And so that's the, that's the political answer. It's not on my list. Now the team's like, uh-oh, he's not following his finance lines. And the ambassador's like, we're not inviting him back again. <laughs> um, but look- so Just teasing you. all of memoranda of cabinet. Okay, so if I was to give you a one phrase answer to how do we mainstream gender equity and policy making, it's one phrase, gender-based analysis plus. And so that's the one for, do you wanna comment on that? We can have a back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. And have you been able to, you know, to measure the, the outcome of the- Absolutely. The In every one of our memos to cabinet, there's an accompanying quality of life framework analysis that shows the environmental impact, the social impact, the impact on gender. And it's, it's literally right there. And you can't get through reading your memo to cabinet or even having your deck prepared at cabinet without the gender aligned lens. And then in 2018, uh, 2017, we have Canada's first ever gender statement. And then in 2018, we established Canada's gender results framework and our parliament passed the Canadian Gender Budgeting Act. So now that's part of the law of Canada. And our most recent budget builds on that. And I'm gonna share the additional technical comments here, but let me share the three pillars, okay? So legislating and mandating gender considerations into decision-making processes for new and changing policies, making public the results of those analyses to be transparent and to increase awareness, and also to show us when we, when we don't hit the mark so that we can do better next time. And then systematically monitoring and evaluating existing policies to ensure that government tax and transfer programs are meeting the government's gender goals. So that's really important for us. The act has teeth. We got to report back on the terms of gender and diversity of all new budget measures. Once a year, we have to make the information available to the public and we have to share publicly the analysis of that data. And to not take time away from my colleagues because there's still four pages here, I'm not going to read them. Um, because I want to go upstream because there's a friend and a colleague in the room here. And I think the way that we make this mainstream, if we get out of our deputy ministers and director generals and inside the shop thinking, it's got to go upstream. And gender issues have to be issues for political parties of all stripes. And why do I say that as a government minister? Because it's 50% of our population. Every party should have gender equality. And whether you come at it from a human rights perspective, or an economics perspective, it's just good policy and it's good politics. And I say this because my colleague, the Honorable Aaron O'Toole, former leader of the Conservative Party of Canada is here, and I'm a liberal minister. Why am I saying that my friend Aaron O'Toole is in the room? Well, because we were pushing hard 
to get conversion therapy banned because it's an odious practice that affects both men and women in the LGBTQ community. And Aaron's leadership got us to a unanimous consent motion, which means that immediately the project, the bill became law. And that's what our constituents want from us. They want us to work together. They want us to advance human rights. They want us to advance women issues. And so it's both policies and politics. So Aaron, wherever you are on the floor of OECD, thank you for your leadership and thank you for leading your caucus there because it was an important step, not just for Canada, but for the world. Thank you very much. This is really, really interesting. And it, there is also the, um, the issue of the transparency that I find extremely important, uh, uh, in particular for mainstreaming this thing. Now, um, Deputy Minister Yoriogon Thales, you've been telling us that Mexico has been very active, actually. Also, you know, you've been also in indicating the importance of the financial education and, and and issues like that. But in particular, with respect to the tax and transfer uh, system, uh, what um, do you think Mexico has got right for gender in for addressing gender inequality? No, thank you for for the question. And, and as I was mentioning on my, on my first intervention, uh, I mean, we decided actually to change the, 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 the cash transfers programs. And before this administration, practically the focus was a conditional cash transfer program uh, with very specific elements. Uh, when we assessed that, uh, we figured out that this, this kind of a scheme was kind of focalized, focalizing the transfers but we're creating rigidities for people to take decisions and specifically for, for those that, for, for that population that were in rural areas, for example, they couldn't move. And so they were having the transfers, but they couldn't take decisions to. So we decided to change the program. The president uh, decided to have a, a, a universal cash transfer program is not conditional anymore. So we are tackling several, uh, I would say several social gaps it's not only poverty as an emerging uh, economy, we still we're not facing only environmental issues, we're also facing social gaps. And we are trying, and, and, and this, this change of the model is trying to be universal, to have more impact in, the, in, in several social gaps. So one of that ones is uh, gender equality. And that's why we decided to change the, the programs. We have a, a matching skill program that is uh, at least requires that 50% of the people that can be in that program has to be women. Also, we are providing cash transfers for uh, working mothers. Um, and we, we uh, implemented a new, a four layer on, on our uh, result-based budgeting. We have a, a budgeting that is not green, it's sustainable because we decided that uh, we are not only bringing the environmental topic or challenges in the, in the budget, but also the social gaps. That's, why it was done, that's one of the reasons why we're using uh, the sustainable development goals, goals of the UNDP into this budget, uh, budgetary lines and budgetary approach. Um, and that's, that's on the budgetary side. But then we decided also to take some decisions of some actions in, in terms of uh, tax policy. One of the first actions that we did was to eliminate, to, to establish a zero rate BAT for, uh, for uh, the products for uh, menstrual hygiene. Uh, uh, question menstrual, I forgot. <laughs> I think I Management, in menstrual management, a, a menstrual hygiene, hygiene management. Um, and we decided to have that because uh, there were several in each policy, public policies that were being pursued by the, uh, the, uh, of the, of the subnational states. They are, they are pursuing to provide these products by, uh, free for, for, uh, uh, for teenagers, uh, spe especially because they have identified that they don't attend school during those periods. And that eventually affects uh, affects the, uh, the, the, the professional formation and academic formation of women uh, from the very from the very early stages. So the subnational states started to discuss this and make this uh, mandatory for all schools to provide uh, uh, free, this, this product free. And we decided to reduce the, the VAT uh, to 0%. So we paid in Mexico 16%. We, are, we decided that these specific products are gonna be 0%. And, and I guess, um, and so we managed to have a, we achieved a, a reduction of around 10% of all the, of the final prices for consumers 
in the first 15 days that when we implemented the the uh, uh, the policy then we have the impact of inflation from <laughs> from several reasons and that's why we then achieve the the reduction of 16 percent part of the inputs also are imported but that's one of the actions that is already in, in implementation in mexico and what we are what we want to do for the next economic program is to um, to provide tax deductions for um, for all the households that are paying for childcare or private childcare, uh, since we have a, a, a limited fiscal space, we need to provide that that at least that option for for some specific families. There are some uh, some equality issues there that we need to discuss, but we we don't want to resolve the, to all the issues by by one by, by uh, uh, at once. So we're, we're, we will want to provide that, that specific uh, tax incentive. And we also want to work on the structure of the revenue, uh, of the revenue tax. What we want to do, currently we provide um, um, uh, a tax credit for the lowest deciles, and we want to increase that tax credit for women in order to facilitate or to reduce the cost of hiring, uh, hiring women into the, into the formal labor force. And that has been approved by, by the top management in, in Mexico, and we, need, we are working on the design of these, these specific measures, and we want to include that in, on the economic program for 2023. And finally, we are also um, facilitating that uh, all the firms, or specifically big firms and SMEs, should be could deduct all the investments that they do in childcare that they provide for for their system. No, that's a, that's an impact on tax collection. Uh, so, from the Ministry of Finance perspective, we don't like to use to change much, <laughs> but we do uh, we do recognize that it has a, an impact on investment. It has an impact on productivity and competitivity, and we need to start um, moving things moving things around. And just to, if you allow me, very quickly, we are not just addressing this topic from the tax perspective. We are also uh, we created the the, the gender equality committee in the financial sector in Mexico. It is together with all the with all the banking, all the bank, all the banks, uh, insurance companies, pension funds. Now we are trying to build together an agenda that achieves to that it's trying to achieve two, two things. One is uh, to bring more women into decision making, and that is the requirement is that at least thirty percent of the committees and boards should be uh, we should have the participation of, of women. 30 percent by 30, at least 30 percent and also trying to bring women in decision making uh, we think this is going to have an impact on reducing biases when you when the when the financial sector take decisions either to provide uh, insurance or to provide uh, some kind of funding or, or credit lines uh, so this seems to be a, a very nice way to construct this agenda uh, given that all all economic actors are are, are providing inputs and building this these specific actions um, also, uh, well, as I said, we connected or we bring this the, the gender equality topic into the uh, productivity committee, and we are discussing that from that perspective. Uh, it has it has returned. We have identified that if we manage to increase ten percent of, of, of women participation, we will we will increase our potential GDP growth by by zero point seven percent permanently, and that's one of the challenges that we are trying to to address. Um, and finally, we also are pro piloting pro uh, training programs to incorporate more women through financial inclusion, financial, educa financial education, uh, uh, and trying also to connect with e-commerce, with e-commerce and the digital economy growth that we are experiencing in, in Mexico. So uh, the solution is not only only on the, on tax. Uh, we know there are some specific uh, inequalities there, but we are trying to go beyond that and trying to have a, a multi-dimensional multi approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. I mean, we see that, I mean, the challenge is uh, a complex challenge and the, the agenda that uh, has been developed uh, develops along different dimensions. And also for the taxation part, it has to do with direct indirect taxation allowances and things. It is very, it gives the, it, it, it gives a, a clear idea of how complex the issue is. So, um, uh, State Secretary Anson, can we listen to the Swedish ex for the Swedish experience? Yes, and uh, thank you. Uh, I would first uh, like to thank OECD for recognizing the work that we have done on this topic, and uh, also the Secretariat 
uh, for putting together the report on tax policy and gender equality. I think this is a very important and useful tool. Uh, in Sweden, uh, as you mentioned, gender mainstreaming has been top priority for a very long time and uh, uh, an analysis on gender uh, equality has been part of the government's budget all uh, back since the late 1980s and since the uh, early 2000s the government has worked systematically uh, with gender budgeting and this means that choices of directions and resources in the budget should promote gender equality as far as possible. And uh, in order to support the work with gender bud uh, budgeting in policy, uh, the government has developed an analytical tool. And it, this tool is actually very nicely summarized in, uh, in the report by the OECD. So I highly recommend it. Uh, the aim of this tool is to help officials to determine whether a gender uh, perspective is relevant and then to conduct a gender analysis and to account for the proposal's impact on gender equality. And this tool was developed uh, for the core activities of the government offices, but then it has also since uh, been adapted uh, by public agencies, by municipalities and by other organizations. Um, in Sweden, the effects, especially on, uh, on the tax liability for women and men, is an important and mandatory part of the impact assessment that precedes all tax proposals, as, as you mentioned. I mean, I think this is becoming more and more uh, something that everyone is looking into. And it, I think it's very important because once you actually see those diagrams, uh, you can scrap something that you thought was a good idea because it's not. Uh, and I think it's often that uh, that is useful for real to have this uh, because um, you see uh, all the uh, all the impact that your policies are making. And um, I think also uh, the, uh, the, the budget, in, it includes a description on how all the proposed changes in the tax and transfer system affect the disposable income of women and men and the welfare services provided by the public, such as healthcare, education, childcare, they also affect the economic well-being of the population. And uh, the, uh, the budget includes an analysis on how changes in the provisions of such services do affect men and women. Uh, in Sweden's uh, statistics is uh, commissioned annually to evaluate the government's office work with gender mainstreaming. And for example, they evaluate to, to what extent the tables and figures in the government text, such as the budget, are presented and commented on by, from a gender perspective. And these annual eval, uh, evaluations, they have been important to make sure that the government is working in a correct manner with gender mainstreaming and, uh, and doesn't stop but creep keeps progressing in these uh, respects. And the, the type of gender analysis re uh, relies on, on an important tool for tracking and evaluating developments, and that is gender disaggregated statistics. And this is very important. The, these statistics, they are uh, necessary to analyze the developments in gender equality and identify the remaining policy gaps that we still have. Uh, in Sweden, we have had access to gender disaggregated uh, data for income, uh, and it has been available uh, for decades, um, much thanks to uh, our social uh, uh, number system, which uh, is uh, it's very easy to sort out gender statistics from the, from the identity number. And... Uh, 
I think yeah, the, the report on tax policy and gender equality is a great example on how the OECD can further contribute to the policy discussion and highlighting the need for gender disaggregated statistics and also assisting countries in developing the, their capaci capacity in the area of gender budgeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Alani, we've been hearing uh, so much. And my, now my question to you is uh, from the business from point of view, given the many things that can be, you know, engineered to address the issue of gender equality, what would business like to see government doing? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, I think as business, we recognize that the the benefits of gender equality go way beyond the workplace and way beyond our own uh, uh, our own sphere, uh, and that therefore um, gender equality, in terms of its contribution to inclusive growth or any kind of growth, is always something which is going to be be good for the world, but but also particularly good for business. And um, our focus within business has been uh, on on identifying those positive drivers for inclusive and representative workplaces uh, and, and trying to identify not only good policy, but also good practice uh, examples that uh, help ensure that we and inspire successful inclusive workplaces. Uh, our business at OECD Tax Committee uh, has taken the issue of, of tax policy uh, as a uh, priority part of our uh, inclusive growth uh, agenda and uh, and we see that the tax is not only important uh, in terms of the role it plays within the workplace but but also more broadly uh, in terms of those sort of tax policies that we would like to see then then largely we're, we're focused on those things that help to improve incentives for for greater representation and participation in the workforce uh, and that remove disincentives. So, so looking at uh, marginal tax rates, for example, for, for part-time work or for uh, for single workers as, as opposed to to, uh, to couple work. Uh, looking at tax rebates for childcare, tax incentives for for employers and employees for for hiring new people. Any other kind of support for investment in education and training, either at the individual level or the, at the firm level. So those would be, I think, some of the, the key areas that, that we've been focused on. I think we also have to take a bit of a step back, though, and just think about our role as business in, in, in informing decisions that are taken at the level of, of states on the balance uh, of taxation between taxation of income and wealth on the one hand and, ta and, ta and taxation of consumption on the other, given the disproportionate impacts that those tend to have on gender equality. Uh, but we recognize that, that focusing on the workplace is, is not enough uh, uh, and focusing on tax incentives that, that help to expand the workforce are, are not in themselves sufficient. We really would also like to see tax policies that encourage women as entrepreneurs uh, starting up and growing new businesses. Uh, so whether that's, on a, whether that's on education, access to finance and so on and so forth, I think we can all work uh, well together to, uh, to ensure that that's happening. Uh, so we do think that, uh, that as well as the importance of ensuring tax policy supports this mobile, flexible workforce, uh, attractive workplace, uh, uh, and in related policies such as encourage women in fields uh, where we believe they're underrepresented at the moment and where we would really benefit from their inclusion. Uh, and the, and that those are those fields of the twin transitions that I mentioned earlier of digital and environment. I do think that the work that we do in uh, the business at OECD tax committee has not really taken into account some of these gender impacts to the extent that, that we might have done. Clearly, that's something which which is uh, well in effect in, in many states and it's on a state basis. Uh, but I don't know that we've really looked at the impact on gender equality of some of our existing tax policies. Uh, and some of our existing tax practices and instruments at the international tax level. Uh, and I think it's also important that as business, we, we take a step back and reflect on the impact on gender equality of some of the decisions that we make about business models uh, and business structures. Thank you. Thank you 
all very much for this very interesting discussion. Before we're heading towards the end, we only have 10 minutes left. left. And I would not let you go without sharing with the audience uh, in one minute what would you think is uh, a key message that you would like to convey to us. But before that, and I will give you one minute only to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to uh, transfer to us your key message. But before doing that, let me just check if uh, there is anybody from the floor that would like to take the opportunity of having uh, such distinguished speakers to ask questions. I think, I mean, I think you, we, you know, I personally have discovered so much from this conversation that I can well understand that I don't see any hand up and people are reflecting, but then, so let's then take, take the opportunity for this uh, final, final round and one minute uh, for you, uh, Minister. It sounds like a, a member statement in the House of Commons, so I'm watching the clock now. Um, look, when women and gender diverse individuals succeed, the country succeeds and the world succeeds. And gender equality strategies and taxation and, and policies are the best way to go there. And it's not just a social policy or an economic policy, it's the right thing to do. And we know that an intersectional approach is the best way to recover from the pandemic. So we welcome the OEC's work on taxation and gender. We've made great progress with this kind of analysis. And there's more kinds of conversations that we can have being with our friends here. And I've been honored to share uh, with you some of the experiences in Canada, but here's how you know it works. When I am knocking on a door and I meet Danielle and she's an electrician and she's building the light rapid train system in Edmonton. And she says, I've got two boys. I'm a single mom. You've given me five years of work. Thank you. Keep building the city because it gives me work and it gives my boys hope. That is what we're talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One minute for you, Deputy Minister. Yeah, sure. No, uh, no I would say just that, um, and probably I will say very quickly an, an anecdote. When we're trying to implement these policies, most of the time you have this pushback. People trying to say, tell you, well, let's wait until the law is enacted, is passed, or this discussion. So maybe we should not avoid uh, the power of leading by example. We don't need exactly to have all these in laws. I mean, I don't want to disregard policies. It is important for, for enforcement, but you can also, we can also advance a lot of things just by doing it, not, not waiting to, for, to have it. It's a public policy. And just a, a finally remark, um, uh, in the case of Mexico, we have been trying to develop this sustainable finance agenda. And one of these specific, as I was mentioning, is not only green, it's also social. And one of the most important social gaps in Mexico that we want to tackle is gender equality. And that's one of the reasons we are bringing all this uh, financial inclusion, education, and gender uh, equality in the financial sector is the sector that mobilizes resources in the economy. And if they take this criteria, when they are providing funding for some specific projects and they bring the gender uh, perspective in it, in this decision process, it will have an impact. And that's one of the objectives that we're pursuing uh, when we are talking about, about sustainable finance and, and has, it has this, this gender, gender dimension. So I will close here because of the benefit of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. One minute for State Secretary Ancions. Thank you very much. And yes, uh, as I, I reflected in my first remarks, I know that Sweden often can come across as a bit, uh, we have done this for many years, so we know how this should be done. And I know also that um, uh, there has been things uh, which have not been, do, uh, been done so greatly in Sweden in, uh, in for, for many, many, many years. And last time when I was here at the OECD, I was here to accompany uh, my former uh, boss, the, uh, the finance minister of Sweden. And uh, one of the things that we never had in Sweden was a fe female prime minister. And now sh we, we do have Magdalena Andersson as our prime minister. So uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And uh, I can really say that it does make 
a huge difference to see that you can have a female prime minister also in a Sweden like country that has been doing structural work in gender equality for many years. Indeed it is, it is a great thing. I had the pleasure to see your prime minister working in many, many ECOFIN councils, so I know what, uh, what is she like, and I think it's very good for me to have her. And now I'll with you one minute for you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. I'll try to be brief and maybe I'll, uh, I can sum it up by paraphrasing the uh, the minister. When women are successful, business is successful. So uh, I think that's uh, probably where we start and finish. Uh, the work uh, of the uh, Tax Committee of Business at OECD on inclusive growth and tax policy for inclusive growth sees gender equality as a central plank uh, of the work that we're going to do. I think it's important that, that we in business work together with, with uh, those of you in government to ensure that that the analysis and the learnings from the analytical tools that we have to understand the impact of tax policy and practice on gender equality is shared, understood and leveraged as much as possible. Thank you very much. I would really like to thank you all for an excellent panel discussion, very thought provoking, very interesting, full of suggestions and an idea. And, uh, you know, pointing at the fact that, that somebody said that, you know, women are 50% of uh, the population in the world, but their energies, the energies that that goes into the, you know, into our, into the world is a lot less. And the policies need to be developed and well designed to allow the, this potential to be completely uh, deployed. Thank you very much for this. Um, and I would like now to uh, for you to take your seat in, uh, in the front row. And I would like to conclude this um, uh, meeting uh, calling upon uh, a Secretary of State and Under Secretary of State Guerra for uh, to you know conclude our meeting with the concluding remarks and with this we will close our today event. Thank you for thank you all for this uh, fruitful discussion that allowed us to gather different points of view and national experiences on the role of public policies, in particular of tax and transfer systems in fostering gender equality, also in light of the lessons drawn from the pandemic crisis. I would like to make three points uh, which, which uh, help me summarize uh, the take home messages from today. First, gender equality is a cross-cutting dimension that should be embedded into all field, uh, fields of public policy action, as gender neutrality in public policy does not exist. In this respect, gender budgeting is the fundamental tool through which policymakers can integrate gender concerns into the policymaking process becoming aware that the decision taken in each policy field may produce a differentiated impacts for men and women. To the same, gender budgeting was also included in the framework of the 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development and the OECD together with the UNDP and the UN Women are responsible for the monitoring of SDG indicator 5C1 which measures countries' efforts to track budget allocations for gender equality throughout the public financial management cycle and to make these allocations publicly, publicly available. But the potential of gender budgeting goes behind gender equality goals. It brings advantages in terms of increased accountability. It promotes goal-oriented policy making because the effects of policy actions on beneficiaries are made clear. It contributes to a more effective planning of policy interventions and a more efficient use of public resources. Hence, the increase of transparency in the budget resource allocation process should translate into improved well-being for both men and women, fostering a reorganization of society, overcoming stereotypes on gender roles. 
In order to full, fully reap the benefits of gender budgeting, gender impact evaluations of public policies should accompany the entire policy cycle, budget planning with exact evaluations, implementations, implementation, monitoring and budget reporting with, um, with exposed evaluations. This last thought brings me to the second point I would like to make. As the saying goes, what gets measured gets done. We should invest more in upgrading statistical capacity to achieve improvements in data, in data availability, timeliness, quality, gender, and other social status marker disaggregation. Indeed, enhancing statistics is crucial to adopt an, ev an evidence-based approach to policy design and thus carry out a preliminary context analysis of the well-being domains where gender inequalities emerge with the goal of identifying policy priorities for action and then proceeding with gender impact evaluations of different policy options. The ultimate goal is to take informed decisions about the most appropriate policy package to implement and measure final outcomes so as to introduce corrective measures if needed. In this realm, the OECD has done an outstanding work and can further contribute to the policy discussion, both by highlighting the need for high quality gender disaggregated statistics and assisting countries in developing their capacity. Unfortunately, some currently available statistics broken down by gender are still unsatisfactory in many counties. OECD countries may then consider devoting more human resources to this crucial activity. The third point I'd like to make is on, is on the relevance of international comparison on the issue of gender inequalities and the best policy answers to put forward. The OECD provides a highly valuable, con valuable contribution also in this regard. Indeed, level and degree of gender inequalities differ across countries and may take different forms, but they have common rules. Taking this into account, constant information exchange and comparison of national experiences may help identify best practice of gender mainstreaming with reference to both methodological and policy tools. I think high-level discussions like the one we had today are seminal for further advancements toward the design of policy interventions able to integrate gender equality concerns and as a result close the gender gaps. Thank you all once again for your contributions and a special thanks to Fabrizia La Picorella for being such a good master of ceremonies today. And this, and this closes our event with only three minutes, four minutes of extra time, which I think is remarkable. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to the Secretariat. Thank you to the Italian uh, delegation, uh, um, the permanent delegation uh, who has been helping, supporting us. And thank you all for um, participating to this uh, seminar.